roll things up here since we have a, a time limit. Uh, I'm going to ask my panelists to come up here. So that would be Joel, Mitchell, and Hall. Y'all could join me up here. Great. So today we have our 10 Capital Quick Pitch. Uh, we have some wonderful companies for everybody and um, some great Q&A that's going to happen today. Um, let me start by introducing Joel. Joel, if you want to give us some uh, information about you and a quick background. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Shane and Hall, for, for hosting us this afternoon. Um, my name is Joel Van Ness, and I work at City Different Investments. We are an investment manager uh, located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, primarily manage around 300 million in assets right now, primarily through public equity and public fixed income strategies. Uh, what's more applicable for the call today is we've partnered with a more traditional VC out in Silicon Valley uh, to launch our own venture fund. So we're, we're in the process of fundraising for that right now, uh, targeting 50 million primarily uh, early stage enterprise SaaS companies. Um, but we are actively making investments through our internal capital. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to hear, hear the pitches this afternoon. Great. Uh, Mitchell, you could do the same. Yeah, hi, um, Mitchell Posada. Spent over a decade in the Valley back at the height of the dot com uh, and then moved to the Midwest to be closer to family. Got to see that startup ecosystem for about 10 years before moving actually back to Colorado. I'm in Boulder uh, and have been doing this advisory team as a service for a little over two years um, and just very happy to be getting a chance to work with 10 Capital and I'm, I'm on these kind of meetings fairly frequent, so hopefully I can add some help. Great. We're happy to have you. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, 10 CEO Hall, Hall Martin. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Yeah, my name is Hall Martin, for those who don't know me, and I run 10 Capital and have been an angel investor for 20 years now, so have found uh, it, a great way to keep up with the technologies and the industries that are out there and meet great people as well. So glad to be here today. Great. Uh, so with that, we'll uh, jump into our um, presentations for today. Like I said at the beginning, if you have any questions during the uh, presentations, go ahead and ask them and we'll try to get them for the audience members. Um, and with that, uh, I'll bring up with Cal. So you're going to have a loose five minutes, we'll call it. Um, whenever you're ready, pull up your slides and I'll start your time when you start. All right. Thank you, Hal and Shane. You can start right now. Let me start my timer also. Well, thank you everybody for, uh, you know, joining today. My name is Cal Shelby. I'm the founder and CEO of WITH. WITH is a rideshare carpool company that is addressing the mobility needs of the 21st century for parents, for students, as well as universities. Our platform offers a safer rideshare around the campus, as well as long distance when they go home, uh, come back to school, visit friends at other universities, etc. Begin with the traction. We currently have about 23 major universities in our pipeline, representing over a million users. Three of those universities have actually shut down their bus system, Florida, Florida uh, Gulf Coast, Georgia Southern, and University of Massachusetts. We have just launched our pilot program at the University of Alabama, obviously for reasons that everyone knows the University of Alabama, it's the biggest school in the SEC, et cetera. Um, and uh, we will be fully launched uh, in the fall. We will continue in the summer session right now. Our competitive advantage is basically, number one is our closed loop system, whereby all of our users are vetted through multiple channels that they are current students, faculty, and staff. We are also taking a more personalized product lead growth approach with our partnership program with the organizations at the universities. Partnership for these organizations could mean anywhere from $5,000 to $20,000 per year. All they have to do is convert their membership into either drivers or riders for us. The benefits for us is obviously a faster adoption rate, the emotional tie between us and all the users. And when we begin to scale to other universities, they become our ambassadors to reach out to their counterparts at the other universities to let them know about the partnership program. And finally, uh, the sponsorship program, which I will talk about shortly. So why with? Safety has been the number one issue we have heard from all of the major universities, from schools, as well as students, 
and especially from sororities. Beyond the safety measures that we have already implemented, we're also considering others uh, within our app. So what are the benefits to the organizations and to the university? With will reinvest up to 50% of our revenue through uh, driver pay, as well as organizational revenue share right back in the university community. Uh, Uber and Lyft can offer zero. And the reason being, and we believe this is a barrier to Uber and Lyft is 65% of their revenue goes back to the drivers. One of the major elements of the milestones so far is COVID, which has you know, changed the world. Um, basically it allowed us, and when we started, it was a carpool company, but with, uh, with COVID, we pivoted to include also rideshare. All right, the, we are addressing right now out of 4,400 colleges and universities, about a thousand universities. The markets are actually pretty large when it comes to ride share as well as uh, carpooling. Our business model, we were just down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama the last four days. And I can tell you, we've met with over 30 business owners who have basically said that they have some major problems with their students who work for them, especially at the end of their shifts, finding rides back to their cars. Uh, which typically they have to park about a mile, a mile and a half away. We've met with a number of organizations who have signed up to assist us. Uber and Lyft surge pricing, uh, which is around $20 to $40 from what everyone has been telling us for a one mile ride, which lasts only for four minutes, has really uh, priced themselves out of the student market. We are looking to add a subscription model, which is a predictable mobility cost for students as well as their parents. At the University of Alabama, uh, they're averaging around $2,600 uh, dollars per year uh, through the tuition for transportation costs. We will be offering the university um, a, safe, a safe ride program, whereby if they designate 25% of, of that uh, $2,600, uh, we will give each student 60 free rides if they can utilize at any times. And again, here is where the role of the, these organizations will be to reach to the administration and push them to adopt this safe ride uh, program. The unit economics actually work very well for us because in Alabama, the minimum wage is $7.25. So this is a uh, pool. That means the driver can pick up more than one student's three riders per hour, and we are at a break even. The data that we'll be collecting with the student is the most important element of data. Uh, and we will be collecting three touch points, geographics, demographics, as well as psychographics. There'll be other markets that we can get into. There are 17 states that are considering corporate carpool. We're looking for $2 million of which 200, uh, 250,000 have already been um, spoken for under either a safe or a convertible note. I've got a great team put together with over 200 years of startup experience. And with that, I'll take some questions. Great, yeah. Uh, any of our panelists um, who wanna start with questions, go ahead and shoot. I'll start with compliments first, which is typically how we roll. I didn't have any clarifying questions, but I, I like the fit for purpose. I was advising a, you know, nanny, nanny share ride. So you get nanny and kid. So I saw the complexities of that from customer acquisition to the complexities of you now having an underage, <laughs> underage child and getting the, the economic, economics to work. So you answered a ton of, ton of those questions that I would have always had, but now you, you prompted them with your deck. So I thought that you answered a lot of the questions I think someone would want to know uh, that that has done any kind of mobility. Um, so kudos to that. Um, um, the question that I have is around um, the, how much of the, how much of these university rollouts are you seeing it sort of like a consistent type of pattern or, or are you seeing sort of differences and you're just ending up sort of solving different problems for each campus like how much of you feel like you've learned through just the, the ones that you have now that that gives you that you can convey with confidence that that you have sort of a, enough of a playbook figured out sure yeah i think um thanks for that question uh, mitch um you know one of the biggest things that we're seeing is a lot of universities whether it's costs or whatever they're basically shutting down a lot of their buses or the bus system 
uh, at the University of Alabama, I can tell you from the director of transportation, they've told us that their bus system basically is 90% empty. We saw that firsthand at different hours of the day that students are not using it. In fact, it was even drizzling on one of those days and the buses were still empty and students were walking. And so they are very, very happy for us to roll out over there. Um, and then again, they have told us that they would begin shutting down some bus routes. Not only that, but here's the buy-in. They've also told us that they will allow our drivers to use the bus routes under special placards that they will give us. And we're seeing that, whether it's a trend at all the universities, et cetera, uh, I don't know, but you know, we're hearing that. The second thing is, as I mentioned, uh, when you talk to the organizations, when you talk to the university, um, the number one issue that they, al they always raise is the safety element. And they feel because of our closed loop system that all of our drivers, all of our riders are from the same community and they are vetted through multiple sources that this is gonna make a much better, safer environment for the students. And we've been told that by all of the sororities, the 19 sororities uh, at the University of Alabama. I'll jump in here with a quick question and thanks for, thanks for the presentation. Um, I know particularly before Uber and Lyft were so prominent that a lot of schools had um, experimented with creating their own internal programs, uh, particularly to address uh, you know, drinking and driving issues. Um, from your, you know, from your knowledge of the market, are there many schools that have existing programs already um, with ride shares with students for students or, or with faculty for faculty, or have those been essentially eliminated with um, kind of the prevalence of Lyft and Uber? Yeah, so actually the CEO of Lyft, uh, Logan Green, in 2008 started a company called Zimride. And I, back then they were in apps, it was basically a website. Um, and he created that, this company. And within three years, he had 125 universities that were paying him $10,000 a year just to use the, the website, if you will, for their student faculty and staff to carpool together at that time, not even ride share. And so um, that company was sold to Enterprise, which converted the concept of student with cars off other students without cars rides into you know carpool but rent the car from us thereby killing you know the idea that he had so to answer your question joel um yes there are some universities like colorado university as others that have a little bit of pool of um a uh, little bit of uh, carpooling if you will for their faculty and staff but not on a major level this really would save uh, a lot of money for them and they don't have to sit there and run it great thanks Great, uh, and that'll conclude our Q&A for now, but like I said earlier, uh, at the end, if we have extra time and we want to come back to some things uh, that is doable, uh, thank you, Cal, for your presentation, and uh, we'll move on to the next one. Larry Kim from Mobile Monkey. Great, thanks. There we go. Uh, awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen here? Yes. All right, so I'm talking about my company, Mobile Monkey. This is a sales outreach automation uh, software, uh, plus we have a lot of sales prospecting data. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, lists and stuff like this. Uh, and specifically it's like creators, influencers, and, and B2B, or sorry, B2C data as, as a service. Uh, and uh, so, so what's the biggest challenge for, um, you know, over hundred million mid-market, SMBs, uh, you know, in terms of sales and marketing challenges, it's, it's sales outreach. It's just like most of them are not consistently following up on their leads. Most of them aren't doing any amount of outbound prospect, prospecting and the cost for these, you know, SDRs and BDRs like sales development representatives is, is, uh, is, is very expensive, 6,000 or, or more per month. Uh, now, uh, so what's Mobile Monkey? <laughs> it, it's just the sales outreach automation tools and, 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 and data for, for this mid market, uh, you can think of it, uh, uh, you know, conceptually as, as uh, you know, hiring an army of SDRs or, or BDRs to kind of do those types of sales activities that uh, you know salespeople typically do. Except that it's being done by software instead of like at a very expensive and inefficient person. And so, what we're doing here is we're democratizing the power of inside sales, you know, which is a very effective channel for kind of upper, upper, you know, larger enterprise companies, uh, but, but making that available to, um, you know, companies of all sizes. And uh, just, uh, you know, in terms of like specifics, like, like what does it do? Uh, 
you know, it's again, it's 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 the kind of things that a, a salesperson does. It's like you know, following up on the people who visit your website, and we've got some ways of like figuring out like who visited your website, like you know, even if they didn't fill out a form, uh, you know, following up with people who've engaged with you through social media. We've got certain in integrations with, with, with Facebook and Instagram to, to make that uh, seamless and easy. Um, you know, we've got this enormous uh, 50 million database of, of, uh, of B2C creators and influencers. And then we, we take that data and we make it very easy, like in a, like a, almost like a flow chart automation tool to allow for follow up text messages and emails. Um, the result is, is, is a filter calendar with, with uh, qualified uh, appointments. In terms of, uh, we think this is a multi-billion dollar opportunity. Uh, you can think of this conceptually as companies like Zoom Info or Sales Loft or, or Outreach, which kind of do what we're doing, but in an inverted way, like they they sell to uh, uh, larger companies with like, you know, a thousand sales reps or 500 sales reps. Like we're, 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 we're taking those concepts and, and enabling it for, you know, SMB mid-market companies uh you know the, the software is more idiot proof um and and uh and also the data set is completely different so all those billion dollar sales companies uh you know they, they do linkedin data uh so it's it's like job title and you know company characteristics that kind of stuff uh, you know our, our data it's completely different we, we get it from 101 different places and, and including our own sources but it, you can conceptually think of it more as like twitter or instagram so like you could target people who follow certain brands or use certain hashtags. Uh, so, so it, it lends itself to more B2C applications. Uh, you know, we, we, we charge more, the more emails and, and text messages people sell or send, uh, you know, and, and, and um, you know, our, our data sources are competitive advantage. It's, it's impossible to replicate it. Nobody, nobody has this. Uh, you can, you know, target based on 10,000 different demographics interests and, 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 and different intents uh, and then and then we combine that with our sales outreach automation tools uh, the company's been around for a couple of years um, you know we've got executives in, in all the different departments we've got many thousands of paying customers um, the, the company's around 20 it's now 20, 24 people um, our ideal customer persona it's it's these uh, you know they have to speak English they have to have more than five employees in these industries and then in one of these use cases like uh, you know figuring out what to do with a, a list of leads or you know trying to kick off an outbound you know campaign etc etc cetera, et cetera. Um, you know we've got five salespeople working at the company um, they, they generate around 60,000 uh, in, in, in ARR per, per month uh, and, and um, you know so this is scaling nicely uh, and, and uh, the company's grown from nothing to about uh, 2 million in ARR over the last 16 months. Um, so I think that's pretty exciting. Um, you, sh you should never invest in a sales outreach company that can't generate sales. Uh, and and uh, in terms of the, our operating plan, uh, you know, we're trying to get to you know, 20 plus million in, 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 in revenues in the next 36 months. Uh, but like the 2021 was actual. So, so we really did do 2 million last year and we're looking to do around four and a half this, this year. And, and, and we're definitely on track, uh, you know, no, no exposure to cryptocurrencies or, you know, whatever. Uh, so, so in summary, this is, a, you know, it's a, a kind of an interesting opportunity with uh, uh, a product that has strong, strong traction with thousands of paying customers and millions in ARR. Um, you know, I've, I've previously led a a SaaS company uh, that, that was quite successful. I'll tell you about that if, if we have time. Uh, and and the, the the efficiency is there. So like last month we grew our MRR by sorry our ARR by over two hundred thousand, and, and and we burned about eighty thousand. So you know that's like a burn to ARR ratio of 0.3, which is like super super efficient. Uh, and and um, yeah, well, uh, in terms of just you know my background, uh, I, I had another company that was sim similar. Um, it, it was Wordstream, and um, you know I grew that from nothing to about 55 million in revenues, and and uh, you know that that was uh, sold to that uh, uh, was acquired by Gannett, so USA Today, for 150 million dollars in 2018, and I raised about 18 million. So so yeah, and, and that, that I'll uh, stop my presentation there, and, and, and any questions. Great, yeah, let's open it up for questions. Um, anybody on the panel can start. Thanks, Larry. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pricing model that you all are using and what that looks like? 
how do you sure we've got a, a, a kind of DIY do it yourself uh, pricing where you, people can just sign up for it, you know, self service model, uh, and that, that that's around you know twenty twenty dollars a month, and and scales based on how much they send, and then we have an inside sales team that kind of picks off uh, the the more qualified looking uh, you know people, and tries to sell them like you know all these features and functions that are not included in the in, in the uh, self service model and. Those are start at uh, about uh, 400 to 10,000 a month. Um, so uh, it's kind of a, you know, we generate tens of thousands of installs per, per quarter. And, you know, we kind of analyze, you know, the characteristics of who's, who's signing up and we have our inside sales team close the, the more promising looking ones. And my other question was going to be if you could just touch on. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you mentioned how much you're fundraising at this time, or if you're fundraising at oh, this yeah. time. Oh, so, yeah. So, so sorry about that. Yes, uh, we are fundraising. Uh, you know, given the circumstances, we're just trying to be a little, you know, capital efficient. We're, we're trying to do a, like a three million dollar raise, uh, and and um, you know, it, it, it's not. It's just to you know provide some flexibility as we you know grow grow the business and not have to like. You know, time the hiring of every person to to like revenue is coming in and it's growing, but it, it's just more like a if there's someone else you want to hire today instead of waiting till you raise your ARR by twenty thousand or whatever. You know, it just it just helps. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you you quantified this, but um, you mentioned your uh, I believe two million ARR currently over the last sixteen months. Um, can can you talk about what this raise, what kind of milestones this will get you to? Um, in terms of, you know, how long, you know, what, what's burn look like? Is, do you have kind of expectations of, of ARR at the end of this three million raise before your next raise? Anything like that? Um, so, you know, we're we're about three four months from profitability here because you know I, I said we were burning eighty thousand month 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 and we're growing by o over twenty thousand a month in, in in MRR. So you know, call it four months. Uh, but in terms of the milestones, um, you know, this this could last forever. Um, you know, it just, uh, you know, it, it, I feel like there's, it, it, it's, um, uh, it's a discussion. Like like in terms of, um, you know, depending on uh, uh, how ambitious the, the the investor is, and um, you know, uh, how. Uh, how efficiently you want to grow, uh, but but you know the the model shows uh, you know getting to 20 million uh, in, in 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 under under three years. So I, I think that this should last that long. Is it a price round or um, you know just uh, I'm just given the circumstances in the market. I was just uh, thinking uh, uh, keep it easy and 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 uh, do. Um, you know, just like a convertible note. Like we have doc, investor docs and stuff like this. Um, you know, I've raised six million already, and and, and so 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 uh, some kind of a you know valuation cap of you know twenty five million or something like that. And and and, and um, uh, that said, if if somebody was interested in you know doing a price round, I, I'd certainly certainly be able to do it. And and, and we've we've uh, gotten a few inquiries uh, through through the service uh, for exactly doing that. Uh, I would imagine so. Yeah, and I'm familiar with your work <laughs> since I used WordStream at one point. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I can just tell you that this is a big pain, big pain point. I don't know what the you know. I can see the markets you were addressing. Um, obviously, there's there's more, but obviously your list would be super big, and people would say focus. Um, the the human element I find fascinating because I have interviewed or talked to folks who are trying to do. SDR as a service, um, using student, like all sorts of different flavors of, of solving the sales conundrum around SDR and BDR, not so much the account. Man. But do you see how, how, how many people are using that, the higher level service um, where you're using the, the human element um, and, 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 and how much do you envision that growing? Because I imagine those are the higher price point, you know, as folks start realizing that they need more help and, they want to upgrade sure, their their sure. package. 
so, so we, we have a like about a thousand. So we just released the uh, the data component, like the you know the the data component in, in the last two months. Uh, so so uh, we've got about two thousand people spending you know five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand a month. Uh, you know, on, on this uh, data, and and then we send out you know a, a couple hundred thousand emails for them per, per month, and and it's it's not it's actually a software product. It, like it, it you know we we, we generate it, it's not like a it's it's kind of like displacing those SDRs as a service, if, if you will. Um, it, it's not like that's a, my sense, and if you can do that, that's why I, I was like excited. I'm like, wait, this could this, work. This, this, so those people, you know, those SDRs are service. They charge like thirty thousand a month or something. It's it's, it's ridiculous. It's uh, very you know, expensive. We, we we can we can out, we can outsend them. We can out deliver them. We can out target them. We can we we have more discipline on on, on like following up and, and qualifying and converting. It, it's just this is so ridiculously manual and is so ripe for disruption and and, and we see the yeah. opportunity for it. I, I, I agree because I've hired those firms. So that's why I like what you're doing. Great. Uh, with that, we're going to close out the questions once again. Uh, thank you, Larry, for your presentation. And we'll move on to our last one, who is James from Prefix. Hi, Shane. Hey there. Uh, <laughs> I'm back. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm, I'm James Bilodeau, founder and CEO of Prefix. Uh, here filling out an extension we just added to our Seed Plus round, uh, leading into a, a Series A raise, which we're uh, also just about to start. Uh, to put it simply, Prefix eliminates the hassle of home maintenance, and we save our homeowners between 30 and 50% off home maintenance costs. Uh, average homeowner spends $3,000 and 30 hours a year on home maintenance hassle, uh, which is fundamentally a broken process of unreturned calls, service windows, frequently exploited pricing, and general confusion on what ongoing maintenance is needed in their home. Uh, this is one of the biggest consumer problems there is. Uh, until now, there hasn't been much real innovation addressing the actual problem. Uh, marketplaces are funded by contractors may lower search costs, but really address none of the problems we just mentioned. And then there are home warranties, which are really just bad insurance at odds with their customer's best interests. Neither model creates trusted uh, relationships or the ability to monetize them. So how do we fix it? We make it as simple as possible for our members. With Prefix, you get your own dedicated home manager. We hire primarily military veterans with impeccable records and a strong work ethic. If anything breaks, you just call, text, or email. Your home manager takes care of it, usually for just a small copay. So no online searches, no contractor blind dates, no wondering if you've gotten the best possible price. Um, your home manager also comes to your home and performs a 30-point preventive maintenance twice a year. And by 30 points, I mean clean your AC condenser and condensate line, change your air and water filters, flush the sediment out of your water heater, clean the lint out of your dryer outtake, uh, sanitize your washer and dishwasher with a natural cleansing agent, change all your batteries and your smoke alarms, and I'll stop there as I think we've got five minutes, although Shane's being a little bit lenient, so we'll see. Um, for the minority of things that your home manager can't do, you get one of our vetted contractors that we manage all the way through to completion. You get low negotiated rates with no markup. Our technical code goes hand in, hand in glove with our unique operating model. So our home managers spend minimal time on administrative tasks. They come equipped with everything they need for a home maintenance visit. We also have highly granular data on the performance and quality of every home manager. Um, this system was tested over the course of the pandemic, where we'd go sometimes six months without actually seeing a home manager in person, yet know that they were delivering on their K KPIs and delighted customers. From a customer's perspective, we're super easy to communicate with. Uh, you just call, text, or email. Uh, we have the equivalent of Amazon one-click to enroll in the service. And homeowners are able to see all the work we've done and even how much money we save them in their home health report whenever they choose. The data we collect as part of our service means we know how to fix things right the first time. We know everything about the homes that we service. So we solve one of the biggest consumer problems there is. But home maintenance isn't the extent of our business model any more than books was that of Amazon's. By doing the work of solving the broken home maintenance process, we fund the creation of what I call an operating system for the home and trusted sticky relationships with homeowners. This enables us to offer a number of other higher margin services, both to consumers and to industry partners. 
In terms of direct to consumer services, uh, just with our core service, we already have, we start with a margin of 30% in our mature territories through a monthly subscription and co-payments. We're now increasing those margins to 50% as we continue to offer other higher margin services. Late last year, we stood up our own full service HVAC installation company. It's kind of like an Amazon basics of HVAC working through our Amazon Prime like relationship with homeowners uh, that supports our, our core service. The preventive maintenance of our existing service and our ability to install and maintain telematics, things like leak detection, uh, this lowers underwriting risk for insurers by as much as 20%. We're now partnered with a major national insurance provider leading into our second phase of a very large pilot with them starting on June 27th. Uh, we'll be launching solar lead gen and maintenance next in this increasingly energy constrained market. Uh, we solved the last mile problem that's constrained solar adoption, the soft costs. Our relentless focus on solving the real customer problem in this space helps us realize an additional and important part of our business model. The same data that helps us serve our individual customers so well highly valuable in aggregate to both consumers and industry partners. Just as an example, companies like Consumer Reports, JD Power, they make hundreds of millions of dollars from initial quality assessments, and our data is better. At over three million in annualized revenue, we're now six times larger than we were at the start of the pandemic and accelerating. Having carefully refined our operating model and marketing playbook in the greater Austin area, we're now starting our city by city rollout. Strategic uh, partners we've just brought on are adding to this acceleration. Uh, I've only included the second phase of our insurance pilot uh, in this forecast. Uh, we now have a partnership with a major utility with millions of customers in Texas alone uh, that will make this curve even steeper. Even as we've grown uh, more quickly, uh, we've maintained customer service levels that are unique in this industry or, or most industries for that matter. Uh, we have near perfect reviews online and an NPS of 85. Our core home maintenance market alone is worth 20 billion in the US and Jason markets into which we're expanding represent even larger opportunities. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'm happy to dig in further on our city rollout strategy. Um, uh, in, in short, our, our strategic partners get us to almost profit, uh, uh, profitability instantly in any city in which we launch. Uh, beyond the large insurer and utility partners, uh, we've already been working with national real estate brokerages. Uh, in discussions with home improvement retailers, builders, private equity firms with large real estate holdings. This is a universal problem. Um, and many of these potential strategic partners could also eventually be acquirers. Uh, uh, just quick note on the team. We've got a great one. Uh, this is a found, uh, team led company, not a founder led uh, one. Our cap table also composed primarily of very successful operator investors who I consistently rely on for good advice. Uh, includes the Uber syndicate, uh, Jim Ryan, the former CEO of Granger, Jim Finnegan, one of the co-founders of SoFi, and Dean Draco, the founder of Barracuda Networks and now Eagle Eye Networks. And with that, uh, I'll just uh, pause here on a, a quick summary of our, our traction and, uh, and open it up to questions. Great. Uh, yeah. And if you want to just quickly go over the terms of your deal too, I think that would be helpful. Sure. Let me go down here. Unless I missed that. So what we're doing is we just, as of today, um, added another 500K uh, onto a 4.5 million uh, C plus round uh, that was fully subscribed, uh, led by Chicago Ventures who followed on their initial investment. Um, it's an 18 million post money, so now 13 million pre money, uh, which means it's non dilutive when we bring on additional cap capital. Um, a lot of favorable features for investors, 20% uh, discount, liquidation preference to all preferred and common. And uh, we can't bring on additional debt or layer on additional safes. We're going right to a price round as is, is explicitly our intention. Um, so in investors immediately move to uh, preferred uh, uh, holdings, hopefully uh, in, in very short order. Great. Uh, and with that, we'll, we'll do about five minutes here of Q&A. So um, anybody on the panel has a question, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I can start off here and it looks like there's a few uh, questions in the chat as well. Um, James, first of all, I, I think it's a really brilliant idea, um, particularly the preventative maintenance check. Um, I think, you know, I do something similar with your car and I don't know why it hasn't been thought of to do something with your home because you don't know what you don't know. Um, and I think that's one of the most intimidating, uh, intimidating aspects of home ownership. Um, can you talk about hiring your home managers? Um, first of all, are they employees of the firm or are they independent contractors? 
Um, and if the former, how are they, you know, what's your value proposition to actually hire these individuals who I'm sure um, a lot of them are coming from maybe, uh, you know, running uh, their own business as a sole proprietor of a, you know, as a handyman or whatever it might be. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? It's a, it's a great question. And in the, in the spirit of five minutes, I cut out uh, a few slides related to what I call human code. Um, and many people in this space have, you know, we've got consensus models that frequently get misapplied to, to different industries. And in, in this space, the one that, um, and, and the failures are legion, uh, people would take an app, try to create a marketplace and expect 1099 talent to magically infill and create a superior customer experience. And they're almost all gone. Um, so uh, this is more like healthcare. And I think it's telling that the Uber syndicate invested in us knowing that our labor model is appropriate for what we're doing and it's full-time hires. So um, there's a secular trend of shortage of qualified tradespeople and most parts of the country are feeling it. Um, they won't call you back. They won't do small jobs. And the ones that do show up aren't always great um, and pretty expensive. So what we're doing is creating our own. Um, so this idea of primary care for the home, we hire primarily military veterans, usually E5 level. Um, so they have leadership experience. Uh, we interview uh, for the psychographic traits. We look for the role. Um, and then they usually have some degree of technical aptitude coming out of the military. And then we've built our own training facility. We get them up to speed as a tier one home manager doing the preventive maintenance drill in as little as two weeks. It's a very re repeatable process. And that's sort of like your physician's assistant, the person that takes your blood pressure and, and does all that stuff. And you don't want your doctor doing that because then it would be expensive. Uh, so we hire them as tier one home managers and then we continue to train them up to a tier two home manager, a full fledged primary care physician for your home. That takes about four months and they're working at the same time. We get to vet them and they get to see if they want to work for us um, and, and, and show the grit that we want. And then only when we're satisfied um, and we will necessarily call folks out if they're not meeting our, our requirements, they get their own territory. And attrition from our tier two or tier three territories has been almost zero. We've had people that have had to relocate for spouses, um, but we take really good care of our home managers. They've got ownership stakes in the company. They like having a territory, a relationship with home managers. Uh, they're very much embedded in the community. Um, and traditional contractors do not do this with their, with their employees. So uh, they're, they're pretty happy here. So I think we get a similar NPS from our employees. All right, thank you. Sure. Great, and uh, you had a couple of questions in the audience here. Um, Andrew wants to know uh, how you differ from home maintenance companies. Uh, your fee structure sounds similar, he says. Uh, pretty different. Uh, an AC company will they'll sometimes offer these platinum plans. At least that's what some folks here in Austin sell. And that's when someone will go off, brush off your burner. They may clean your condensate line. They're probably not going to change your filters. And they're probably going to try to upsell you on a new system because uh, most uh, contractors that come into your home are working on a 15% commission, which is why you get that feeling when they come into your home and they look around. Um, so um, if I had to draw a healthcare analogy, imagine, and this is to illustrate the difference, imagine you strip out primary care, you're left to self-diagnose when you have a chest pain, decide whether you should go to a cardiologist or a gastroenterologist um, or, or whoever, uh, and then, um, and then uh, have to like have that uh, person take your uh, blood and do all the work and, you know, um, it's extremely inefficient and then have no leverage with them. Um, so they can charge you whatever they want. Um, that's how we take care of our homes. It's extremely inefficient. So we've got primary care. We work on a capitated basis, which is the term you use in healthcare. We're paid to keep your home well, not to do the upsell. And unlike a home warranty, not, you know, they try to not fix things. Um, so this, this idea of primary care relationship basis pricing model, based on just keeping your home well is very different than a traditional contractor. And it enables us to monetize that relationship in a ways that traditional contractors can't because you don't trust them. Great. Uh, well, do the panelists have any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Um, I think Andrew had a follow-up or a more specific in the chat. Um, yeah, he said he meant 
America Can Home Shield, not an HVAC warranty. Uh, and then he also asked what the inefficiency you exploit is. Uh, inefficiency, I'm sorry, what's the last word? Uh, that you exploit. Got it. In American Home Shield is, is just bad insurance, to put it simply. So they use, um, they're trying to make a margin by, um, they will hire third-party contractors in a contractor-constrained market, and then theoretically provide insurance without innovating on the operating model or creating an uh, uh, increased efficiency um, through how they function. So the only way they can make a margin is by hiring either inferior contractors, um, not paying them enough, or by fine print and not fixing things for customers. And if anyone here has experienced a home warranty, usually the response is, I quit. And that's the response of most people. 80% churn in a year is what we understand for American Home Shield, the largest of them um, in, a, in a year. The efficiency comes from working on a dense territory basis. Another slide I cut out, we have a third of the Mueller neighborhood here in Austin where we started. So because of the way we function, um, the efficiency of working on a dense territory basis and the idea of primary care, um, the pricing model where you always trust us, we have really high addressability. And that creates an efficiency, a high LTV. We can spend more on CAC than any incumbent uh, provider. And then we've got data on the home because we have a full relationship with them that makes us predictive in the care. So those are all the aspects of a, a it's a fairly complex operating model that we, we've worked on. Very simple for the homeowner, but creates an efficiency uh, that no one else in this space has, a trusted relationship that we're able to monetize, and then bring on partners like, um, like USAA and NRG that no one else can because of what we do. Great. Uh, and Andrew, um, if you had any other questions, uh, we can connect you guys afterward. I want to move on to closing thoughts here. Uh, and if anybody had any other questions, uh, we still have all of our founders in the room. So I'll open it up to that first. Um, for any of the panelists who may not have gotten their question answered along the way. Um, I think. Nothing on my side of things. Uh, thank you to all the uh, founders that presented today. I think everyone had uh, a great presentation and you all are working on some interesting problems and solutions. Yeah, I totally agree. So I'd seen something like this from uh, panelists or nothing like this, but the first time I got introduced to uh, the check engine light for the home was from KB Homes, which you might want to look into all those folks who are doing home builders, right? You include this as part of the package kind of thing, but yeah, and we were surprised. And then I was in the Chicago market for some time and um, they have a lot of associations related to real estate. Uh, et cetera, which is why they have their own incubator and some funds. If you haven't tried looking at Chicago market, I definitely know some investors that are in this kind of sort of space. Um, but we're they, talking, no we're one, public home builders right now. Oh, okay, good. But yeah, no one's really taking it from like like this this sort of this patient model where really they the, the homeowner feels like there are some, there and the marketing web to 1.0 with it's just killing the trades and making you know, having you find cheaper employees. So there's a reason why those, the window, it's really killing the general contractors, this whole, the, the lead model. It's just awful, um, yep. which is why they can invest in people. So I'm so glad someone asked about the people question, because I do think that is going to have to be the, the bigger differentiator because people talk neighbors. And if they have like a similar, that is going to be sort of like a viral virality. Yes. So I like everything, you, I like everything you, that you presented, but I, and I am aware that there are some, you know, cause I'm not one of those people that can fix the home. <laughs> so I'm one of the people who would use your service, but I am familiar enough with all those trades <laughs> and people who do it, that it's no one's really combined it in, a, in an efficient way um, that, that puts more of the homeowner at, 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 at ease, that they're not getting fleeced in some way, like at some part of the, 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 the experience that they, that they don't know. So I, I, I commend, I commend you for that, but I can imagine it's some, there's some, there's some hurdles. Um, but the people, I, I think the people side is probably one of the biggest things that's going to help you um, really deliver. Um, so it's great to see you've already thought about all the training and the programming and, and the tiering of the employees. Thanks, Mitchell. Yeah, we we led with what I call. Also pretty interesting as well. Actually, I do kind of like. I had some questions on that, but not not from an insightful. I just more curious. Some of these other, other verticals. 
Yeah. Yeah. We led with that human code side of it and we did tech in tandem and I can talk about the tech platform and the data aspect of this, which is, is very interesting, but the two together work really well and companies that haven't focused on the human code, like a lot of great companies build great cultures, great processes, uh, reward employees. And, um, you know, one of our advisors, uh, Jay Steinfeld, he's the founder of uh, blinds.com. He sold it for half a billion to um, Home Depot, and he built that comp company on a great culture, um, selling blinds. Uh, so with a with a really good outcome. Um, so um, can't can't uh, uh, forget the cool element of this. Yeah, yeah. Sign. Yep. But yeah, kudos to everyone. I great great lineup as I expected <laughs> from you guys at Ten Capital. So appreciate being on it. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, uh, with that, thank you for everybody uh, who presented. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, we will be following up with the recording of everybody. If you want your presentation, we're going to share it to our network. Feel free to share it with yours as well. Um, and with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close it out. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.